Welcome to Marin Voices and Views. With Lawrence A. Strick, I'm Peter B. Collins. In our second segment today, we'll talk with Jonathan Freeman, the Marin resident who got national media attention by fighting a ticket for driving in a carpool lane and raising issues about corporate personhood. First, Peter Damon Conley's back with us. You know, he was our first guest 37 episodes ago. Yeah. Uh, but now, Damon's in his second term with the San Rafael City Council. We know he had previously served uh, on the Dixie School Board District for four years. Before, he's also an attorney here in San Rafael with a business practice. He's been Deputy Attorney General. He was involved with the Exxon cases. And he's back now to talk a little bit about the city of San Rafael and Marin Energy. Thanks for having me back. It's good to see you, Damon. Let's talk about Marin Energy first. Your Marin Energy, um, clean energy program, gives the people here in Marin an opportunity to uh, direct money to providers that are using renewables. Uh, your Marin Energy is in its third year. It's delivering power to thousands of folks here in Marin. It's soon to be in the city of Richmond, I understand. Correct. And give us a little bit of update on the progress of what's going on. Where are we going? Well, we're really excited about where we are. And again, just to remind your viewers, uh, Marin is the first operational program of its kind in the entire state. Uh, we're at a very important point in the agency's history. Uh, we uh, achieved full enrollment of Marin as of the end of last year. We have 92,000 customers. Mm -hmm. And this upcoming year, we're going to enroll uh, the city of Richmond, uh, which is very exciting. A number of good uh, initiatives going on with the program, all designed to uh, increase renewable energy and reduce our uh, climate footprint. Uh, among them are some ways of encouraging local renewable energy products. The feed-in tariff program, uh, San Rafael Airport was the first example of that. Uh, if you have a, pro a project of one megawatt or less, uh, either in Marin or Richmond, uh, we'll offer you a fixed competitive price for that. And tell us how feed-in tariff works, because if I have a solar system on my rooftop and I don't use all the energy that I produce, I put it back on the grid, do you pay me, <clears throat> pardon me, the same amount that I would pay per kilowatt hour to bring that electricity to my home? You're talking about a little bit of a different program, but it's related, uh, mm -hmm. Peter. It's called net energy metering. What we'll do is if you overproduce solar on your rooftop, mm -hmm. we'll actually buy the excess renewable power from you at retail price. Uh, this is a competitive advantage for MEA because uh, if you're with the incumbent utility PG&E, uh, they'll zero out uh, your meter for you, as, as many people are aware. Uh, we go one step further and we actually will pay you for that power. So that's the net energy metering program. All right. uh, feed in tariff is literally if you have a, a local project, one megawatt or less, you bid it in to this fixed price that we offer. And we believe it's competitive. There's been a lot of demand so far. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're hoping to really uh, s continue to spur that. Before I ask you the next question, when you say one megawatt, wh what's a megawatt? I mean, is it a, is it a boom box or is it a good plant? Or is it an industrial plant? I, you know, for those of us like me who have can trouble I, with can light Can I bulbs. charge my Tesla? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Well, and then some. Yeah, a megawatt is literally like if you're powering like a thousand homes, a thousand for example, homes. Or, or thereabouts. So it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a bunch of energy. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, it, we're really a long way. 37 shows ago, and you being on here, we're a long way from Marin Energy and the doomsday scenario <laughs> mm -hmm. that PG&E put forth when That's you guys right. were getting off the ground. It's, it's right. really amazing how wrong they were. Well, they were, um, and I think, uh, y you know, the proof is in that uh, we, we have a balanced budget. Um, we are serving uh, customers. We're expanding. 
Uh, we're offering new programs. Uh, for example, now well, we're... Well, I was uh, going to ask you about that, so maybe I could focus it a little yes, bit. A new, yeah. new two-year, $4 million energy efficiency program. Correct. Like that. Correct. What's yeah, that? to start out with, right? Yeah. Not too shabby. Um, we got $4 million from the uh, California Public Utility Commission over a two-year period. Uh, where we will be uh, instituting energy efficiency programs for multifamily buildings uh, for residences, as well as small commercial uh, businesses. Uh, so we are in the process of developing those programs. And, that, and that'll be basically money that will go toward helping people retrofit um, and, and other options that are out there to save energy. I mean, uh, in addition to producing new energy, which is our core mission, uh, we're also helping people save energy. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the criticisms of MEA is that the first contract you signed with an energy producer went to Shell, one of the big oil companies. Correct. So tell us, how many other producers are now under contract, and in your view, has Shell delivered renewable energy and at a fair price? Shell has, and again, just uh, uh, to give the correct history, um, we saw that opportunity as a means to an end. Um, this program ultimately has always been about getting more uh, new local and regional energy on the grid. Uh, Shell served a purpose um, in that we were able to get uh, the program going with a reputable uh, source. Uh, the contract has been very favorable to us. It will run uh, through 2017. Uh, we are already taking concrete steps to transition uh, off the Shell contract, and uh, that includes some long-term uh, procurement strategies. We have uh, currently about 12 other renewable contracts, mm -hmm. a variety of uh, uh, sources from uh, biomass, biogas, solar, uh, and the like. And uh, we will continue uh, to, to do that. We actually are right now going out with a, a competitive process to uh, get even more uh, bidders in that regard. Sounds, think, sounds like things are going great for marine energy. I mean, that sounds great. We are optimistic. Uh, we're working hard. Uh, we always appreciate you know, the feedback that we always get from the public. Uh, but I would say right now that uh, things are looking good. So I'm going to ask you to put on your uh, San Rafael City Council okay. hat, or switch hats right now. <laughs> and the first, uh, first issue that came up recently is that the City Council has decided to engage in contract with a nonprofit uh, to run a downtown streets team. Yes. My limited understanding is, is you're going to get folks who are down on their luck or homeless mm -hmm. or not currently employed and uh, recruit them to work for the city and clean things up a little bit. That's right. How's it going to work? Well, and it's part of a larger strategy. Um, interestingly, homelessness right now is uh, indisputably the number one issue on people's minds in town. Uh, and what we're doing is a multi-pronged strategy. Uh, we actually are uh, going to be hiring a mental health officer. Uh, we're coordinating with service providers. Uh, we recognize there's a law enforcement piece. Uh, but the program you're referring to, Larry, is something that got started in Palo Alto uh, over the last five years. And it's an organized uh, nonprofit uh, that basically goes out and uh, pays uh, homeless folks uh, to take the initiative to uh, clean up the streets um, downtown. It's called the Downtown Streets Team. Uh, ultimately, you can kind of move up in the ranks, so to speak, and become a, a supervisor through the program. And the idea is really to get these folks back on their feet uh, with an employment opportunity. Um, you know, naturally, we'll want to tie it into necessary services, um, housing, and uh, basically just um, it's been called a hand out rather than a hand up. Or hand up rather than hand out. <clears throat> it really seems like a, a worthwhile program that will help address uh, the chronic problems that we have. Right. And in particular, if you give people a sense of purpose, uh, you know, it, it gives them a reason not to sit on the corner and drink or do other things that get them into trouble. That's right. 
That's right. And this program has a good track record. Um, you know, it's not a panacea for all the issues related to homelessness, but again, it's a piece. And we're going to start out small uh, with about 12 uh, participants, but we're hoping even by the first year to grow it to 40 participants. Damon, on another front, uh, back in 2005, San Rafael voters approved a half-cent sales tax uh, override for Marin County. That's going to expire in about three more years. Now you're considering asking for voter approval to increase that to a full 1%. Now, statewide, last November, voters approved Prop 30, which has a five-year sales mm -hmm. tax increase mm -hmm. included. Now, I realize you don't have many options for generating local revenue in the post-Prop 13 era, but at what point does the sales tax become too much of a drag on commerce and send people to buy things in Sonoma County, for example? And at what point does it become too regressive? How do you balance well, it is a balance, and I think you have to set the stage. Um, in this case, I believe the public recognizes the tough decisions we've made over the last several years. I mean, this has almost been an unprecedented uh, time period of, of difficult decisions, and we've made them. We've balanced the budget. Uh, we're uh, improving the local economy. Fortunately, the voters stepped up in 2005 and, and passed Measure S. Um, what we are considering, and that's about $8 million per year, by the way. It's a key uh, part of the city's operations. So you're right, Peter. We are actually uh, considering this year going out and asking for a renewal of that uh, half-cent sales tax. Um, you know, basically from what we've seen, there is a, a, an appetite for the public to do that. Uh, we're doing outreach right now. The bigger issue is whether we ask for a bit more at the same time uh, to address some of the other kind of chronic needs of the city that have not been addressed uh, over the last several years or even longer, like a, a public safety building. For example. So these are deferred maintenance sort of issues? Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Okay, well, you just promised not to hold anything hostage because, you know, essentially Jerry Brown said pass Prop 30 or we're going to hammer the schools. And now we have the federal government saying, you know, don't let the sequester go into effect or, you know, we're going to be laying off uh, 800,000 civilians who work for the Defense Department. And I think that's getting a little tiresome. Well, again, we believe we can make the case. Uh, it's going to involve going out to the public, hearing what's on their minds. We're already starting that. And uh, I think when they understand what we've done, uh, what we plan on doing uh, for the community, I think they'll be in favor of it. Well, I'm going to ask you a question that Peter generally asks. This is, this is his pet peeve. <laughs> I know you guys, you guys here in San Rafael have this red light camera that's driving my, my buddy over here, Peter, nuts. I'm not going to ask Thanks, why. Um, I have not been a victim of it. Uh, okay. Right. If that's what you think is driving it, I do this on principle. Because I've heard it's proceed. not cheap. Bucks. And maybe that's one of the issues yeah. you're about the, 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 to ask. No, 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 no. I, I, I don't care how much Peter has to pay for his ticket. <laughs> what, what I was going to ask is, how's it going? Because I think it was uh, when you first had it, you were going to um, reevaluate after mm -hmm. a certain amount of time, expand the program, contract the program. Right. Where are you in that? So it's a, it's a timely question, Larry. Um, I would say within even the next month or two, uh, we are going to be going through an evaluation process. We'll have a study session at City Hall. Uh, we're aware of the issues, and, and we're hearing about these nationwide and, mm -hmm. and statewide, right? Communities are really deciding whether they want to stay in these kind of programs. There's a cost issue. Uh, I think it was advertised as being revenue neutral. Uh, the c city should not be making money off this, in my view, and we'll find out how it's penciling out. Is it effective? Um, is it actually serving a legitimate law enforcement uh, function, given on the other side there are legitimate issues about, you know, civil liberties and the like? I'd love to talk further about this, but the red light is flashing over here. Damon Connolly, thanks for being with us today on Marin Voices and Views. Thank you, you guys. Thanks, Damon. Joining us now is Jonathan Freeman, a San Rafael resident and political activist. 
He is opposed to the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United, which affirmed the notion of corporations as people in permitting corporate funding of political campaigns. He also started the Thursday Morning Group to address the problems of homeless people here in Marin. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you. Now, you intentionally drove your hybrid in the carpool lane, alone in your car, for several years before you got a ticket? Yes, I certainly did. And I was carrying corporation papers the whole time, mm -hmm. wanting to get this ticket in order to push the point about corporations and persons. So when the officer stops you, pulls you over, the lights go on, and says you're in the carpool lane, mm -hmm. there's only one of you guys in here, tell us how it went down. Well, I said, actually not. I've got corporation papers, and I held these up. I said, I've got corporation papers here. In Section 470, you can check it. Section 470 of the Vehicle Code says that a person is a corporation or a real human being. And he gave me a ticket anyway. <laughs> Did he laugh? No. He was, uh, he fulfilled his role uh, admirably in just giving me the ticket. He probably thought it was like the, um, uh, the guy with the stiff and the hearse or the pregnant woman with the baby. You know, those aren't persons. Well, corporations are person under the law. So you researched this in advance, and you were trying to make a statement about the Citizens United case and the larger concept of corporate personhood, which goes all the way back to a Santa Clara County versus a Southern Pacific Railroad decision in the 1880s, right? 1886, and it's actually, that was a setup. That was the last in a series of, of court cases where uh, the Supreme Court, which was made up of railroad lawyers at that point, decided to, to, to confer personhood on, uh, onto corporations. Mm -hmm. And um, this, uh, the first part of the question, uh, it's not a question about um, Citizens United. It's more a question about the issue of corporations and the fact that they have personhood mm -hmm. and the absurdity of that and the fact that it is enshrined and encoded in law at federal, state, and county, and even city level. I'm just taking advantage of the power that corporations give us in their personhood and using them in a piece of paper that manifests them into being. Mm -hmm. And just using them in the, corporate, in the carpool lane. Well, corporations are clearly completely the product of the state sovereign. And that you can't be a born a corporation. Right. Um, and they have taken on, in many ways, a life of their own. So you get a ticket, mm -hmm. and you got a ticket in your own name, not your corporation name. Is right. that correct? Exactly. So you go down to, was that here in Marin? Yeah, that was here in Marin. Mm -hmm. So you go down to uh, City Hall, not City Hall, you go down to the Civic, Civic Center, Center, and Frank Drago is, is acting as the commissioner, traffic commissioner. Right. What happens? He listens to uh, Troy Dorn, he listens to, For uh, who is the officer, listens to Ford, who uh, presents his argument. And That's Ford, you're a lawyer? Your For attorney, For Ford Green. Ford Green, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, they'll think a car did the talking. Right, yeah. It, uh, um, <coughs> He's been here talking, and he ain't no car. <laughs> uh, it, it was Ford did a wonderful job. And uh, so Frank says, look, you know, it's a very novel and original approach. And, and then he says, well, but the legislative intent uh, of this particular law is to get more persons, people, who knows, into cars in that particular lane during restricted times. So I'm going to have to deny your case. So he looked at the legislative intent on the carpool lane rather than the legislative intent, intent of the uh, statute in California that permits the incorporation of corporations. Well, you can conflate the two uh -huh. because a carpool lane needs persons in order to qualify for that. And the particular code just uh, that he cited me for, 21655 or something like that, it says, talks about how you have to uh, just follow the rules. Well, you follow the rule of Section 470, which defines persons as human beings or corporations, then you supposedly one should be able to use incorporation papers as a person in the carpool lane. But you didn't really mind getting convicted, did you? No, I don't. No. You know, um, uh, because what it meant 
What it meant was that the, uh, he's saying that corporations aren't persons. He's saying there aren't persons for the purposes of driving in the carpool lane, mm -hmm. or he's saying generally they aren't. Because if he said yes, then everybody could use a corporation paper to drive in the carpool lane, because that's what the law says. So I didn't mind getting the ticket. I don't mind appealing. I quote unquote don't want to pay the five hundred dollar fine, even though I have legal costs and PR costs that are a little bit above that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously it's the point. We're going to, what's, this, what's the state going to say on the next level? So is your ultimate goal to get to the California Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court? And can you get there from traffic court? I don't know, but it would be great to be in front of the Supreme Court and then find and figure out what is a person. Because if you go back to three-fifths of the person rule in the Constitution, you talk about personhood, you talk about when women got the right to vote, you talk about uh, Civil Rights Voting Act. Uh, this nation's legal history is all about who is and who is not a person. I'm just pushing that point. And you're getting a lot of media attention about this. Oh, yeah. It's, um, I've gotten calls from the BBC and uh, the Daily Show we're talking to. It's been went viral on the Internet, as we hoped it would. Yet a lot of people really liking this particular so, idea. So it sounds to me like you're achieving whatever goals you set out when you, when exactly. you, when you were carrying around your paperwork for two years. Yeah, I'm still carrying them, but I got them on my iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Is that real paper? <laughs> <laughs> So what, what, do you have a, a stated goal or have you identified, for example, with your attorney, Ford Green, that you hope to ride this up to the state Supreme Court? You know, um, our first right of appeal is just this next, at, at this next level. We don't know. Is that to the Superior Court? In yes, Iran? It's, it's, an, it's the appellate branch of the Superior right. Court. That's what I would think. And, uh, so beyond that, I don't think it's the Court of Appeals that's next. I'm not too sure. Yeah. But the stated goal actually is our mission statement, is to basically generate more awareness of this particular idea of corporations as persons and how unfair and absurd that is. So are you trying to build a movement with your website? Oh, yeah. Do you want oh, yeah. people to like you on Facebook? Like, yeah, we have a Facebook page called Occupy the Carpool Lane. And, of course, you can see the uh, thecarpoolguy.com. You can find out more about uh, the case and the issue. And are you encouraging others to do the same thing? Yeah, definitely. Any copycats so far? Uh, not that I've heard of. Mm -hmm. Not that I've heard of. <laughs> okay. Well, Jonathan, let's turn to one of your other uh, focuses of your activism. You started the Thursday Morning Group to find support and solutions for homeless people. And in the preceding segment on our show, Councilman Damon Conley from San Rafael talked about their new program to uh, help homeless people called the Downtown Streets Team. Right. What do you think of that idea? Well, it's an idea that is, I think it's a great idea. I think it's an excellent idea. And the Thursday Morning Group was, is made up of different segments of the community. We've got the city involved, we've got neighbors, we've got businesses, service providers, and homeless people. All who come every other week now on Thursday morning to talk about what's happening out on the street. And we originally came together with the idea of doing something very similar as to what the downtown street team is doing. When we found out that they were around, we started to actively recruit them and see if we could raise funds and help the city bring them here to San Rafael. And so far, Gary Phillips is the one who's been very good in raising the money for that. So we're very much in support of that. Mm -hmm. What other uh, what other ideas have come up in your group, and where are you going on that to to effectuate the needs that you remedies for the needs you see in the city? Well, um, there was uh, Community Action Marin is a local uh, nonprofit, and they've expanded their outreach to mental health folks with mental health out on the street. That's one. Um, the, uh, as a result of, of a one meeting, Sa uh, Safeway has changed their food vouchers to exclude alcohol so, uh, so that you know, people on the street would be less likely to be inebriated. Um, and um, uh, St. Vincent's has uh, authored some of their security uh, issues as well. 
And we're also thinking of working with St. Vincent to do a similar um, downtown streets program for an, on an interim basis. That's, that's something that's being discussed. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. Um, right now, we're uh, serving as a clearinghouse. And I think the next issue we really want to think about addressing is probably going to be housing and, and wraparound services and where would you locate that. With Ritter uh, Centers, at least coming up in a couple of years, are they going to stay where they are or would they move? Those are all huge emotional thorny issues with a lot of moving parts. And we, our group is just one where we're able to share that information and uh, see what we can come up with, see if we can find uh, some solutions to this. If folks want to learn more about your group, about what you're doing, or how they might get involved, how do they get in touch with you or learn a little bit more? Oh, boy. Um, you know, we're not an institutionalized group. Okay. You know? um, can, can we crash the breakfast? Uh, you actually, you can. You, you email me, you phone me, and see if, you know, and uh, we, we, we're trying to keep it about 15 people because it's a small room, mm -hmm. and we have no budget. And it, it's, that's the wonderful thing about it, is that the people, it's congenial, and we're really, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a group that we're just sharing information, so we don't want to grow our size. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have a really w way right now of advertising what we're doing. We don't need to. Yeah. You know? Jonathan, thanks for joining us today. It's always fun to talk with you. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Thank you for coming by. You bet. Appreciate it.